Okay, so I'm pleased to be able to uh, speak to this astute group. Um, I've known David Rowe for almost his entire scientific life. Uh, we go back a long ways. Um, and I'll tell you in a moment why I chose the title I chose. What I want to share from a scientific perspective today is, is how what David, David's impact on the field of low energy nuclear physics um, and how it is continuing to reap major benefits as we attempt to build a bridge from what I call the top 20th century to the lower 21st century, uh, building a bridge between low energy nuclear physics and high energy nuclear physics. But before I do that, um, you see the next slide, hopefully. Um, it says from humble farm beginnings, this, this is true. And what I've done, I've been in contact with, with John Wood. He sent me some interesting slides. They sh they're showing here uh, a bit of the, the, the early beginnings. You'll see in the first uh, picture here of, of David with his fellow siblings. Um, is Brian on, on the uh, screen show at this point? Anyway, he's there with his sister, Barbara. It also shows the Rowe farmhouse back in England. Uh, it also shows a very important partnership that endured with you know, his, his wife. Uh, I was privileged to stay in their home uh, when I visited Toronto. Um, and it also shows the entire family. Um, David and, you know, of course, and their daughter, Amanda, and I see that she may be on, and, and son, Mark. Um, on the left lower corner is David Rowe, and what's interesting about, or David, uh, uh, sorry, John Wood, interesting, uh, they grew up almost within a stone's throw of one another and yet did not meet um, and that first until David was at the University of Rochester. It's there where I first met David as well. Um, and it was a meeting of the American Physical Society, which was great. Um, but I wanna get back to and tell you just a little bit about um, the past and future as I call it here. And that refers to, as shown in red, a series of meetings organized by Aldo Carvello. Um, there are 12 to date, as far as I know. Um, the first was back in 1987, but most of the meetings were along the Amalfi Coast. And in fact, uh, perhaps I met David more times at those meetings than at uh, any other time in my life. Um, and in fact, a chance encounter was on a, on a hike up to the top of Mount Vesuvius. Of course, we were enjoying the, the beautiful Amalfi Coast, uh, but we also were enjoying the beginnings of deeper conversations about the symplectic group, and I call that David's symplectic spartum, uh, stardom role going forward. Moving on, um, I'm going to give you a very snapshot view of historical perspective of subatomic physics. And on the left of the picture that is now showing, uh, you see some of the major players uh, dating back to the early 1940s. Um, a couple of Nobel laureates there. Um, and, it, and it shows you a, a rich, 50 year development of nuclear physics uh, from that point forward up until the 1990s when things did change and they changed in a big way because all the theories that were possible have been proffered 
to that point could now be checked with the use and assistance of high performance computing tools. And I've indicated that in pink on this slide. And I'll get to a, a more detailed discussion of that in what follows. On the other side, flip side of the coin, the subatomic physics uh, particle part, uh, which deals with not just uh, QED type measurements, but also in really probing QCD, uh, that bridge remains to be built. It does not exist. Um, it exists in part, people talk about it, uh, but it's still something that's out there and I think good progress is being made. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a quote there at the bottom right uh, from Craig Roberts, who is an international theoretical physicist of some significant uh, reputation. Uh, who says that the next few generations may cross the standard model's final frontier, and of that is in fact uh, the emergence of mass. But what we are interested in doing is linking, providing a bridge between the two, and that's what we've I've spent most of my career doing or trying to do. So very quickly, a few highlights, historical highlights. I'll touch on a few in that first um, 50 years of, of the history of our, real history of our field. Uh, deformation dominance and symplectic symmetry, those two things go together. Uh, symmetry adapted no core shell model is something that we added to the mix, which I think David Rowe appreciated very much. And we'll talk about that for a little bit. Then I'll give some early outcomes uh, for lithium-6 carbon-12 um, and then I want to talk a little bit about some breakthrough work um, that I think is just now unfolding. It's called the symplectic effective field theory, which goes beyond um, where uh, we left off with David um, and picked up with uh, uh, the new concept of building the bridge between low energy and high energy nuclear physics. So from a historical perspective, um, showing once again, the early Nobel laureates in this area, of course there was Bohr and so on and so forth, but a, a pause for a special cause because I borrowed from, from a presentation that I made and gave to the, uh, in Sofia, Bulgaria, and the dates are shown on the lower right. Um, but it, it, it also, uh, in that, and it's, it's written, um, a special tribute to David Rowe as a scholar, mentor, teacher, and friend. And you'll see that among the first generation of fermion-based algebraic modeling folks, above all, the person that stands out most is Phil Elliott, who was uh, in England at the time and all his life. Um, and that shows on the first line, others that played in this arena and that I am familiar with and as I have actually written with and in many cases written papers with. Um, there's Ted Hecht, Biedenharn, Mashinsky, so on and so forth. But a standout among these is of course, David Rowe and that's shown in green with the arrow pointing to the left in his contemplative mode. Uh, which he frequently went into. And when he did, watch out, a tough question was probably brewing and in the making and would soon be popped at you. And uh, David and I had fun uh, crossing swords once in a while, uh, but certainly working together towards a common goal. Uh, and much of that had to do with uh, a very special student that, that David had, which was George Rosenstiel, who later came down to Tulane University. And we enjoyed uh, working with George Rosenstiel for uh, many, many years. Unfortunately, he passed away just this past uh, year. So he too of the R&R &R team are no longer with us, but 
much, much enjoyed and appreciated for what they do. Um, I thought it would be useful to pull from a lecture. I'm not sure where it was given. It might have been at the INT in, in, uh, in Washington Institute for Nuclear Physics, but it was a, a what I call a career snapshot from the pen of David himself. And his slides were simple, but deep. And this is what he had to say, that his initial entry into nuclear physics was to give the collective models, which were successful before the microscopic models even appeared um, and continue to be successful, give a microscopic foundation uh, for the shell model itself. Um, and we, as it says here, we find that many nuclear models are associated with shell model coupling scheme. And in fact, much of the early part of the development of nuclear physics was an attempt to give a shell model description of uh, low energy nuclear phenomena. Um, I was surprised to find this. I'm not trying to toot our own horn. Uh, but we had a meeting in, in LSU that David came and George was there and John Wood was there and others were there to just sit down and talk about where we are. That happened in 2017. Um, and one of the things that came up and is shown here in David's own script is in light of what was developed and was unfolding at that time, what does that tell us about nuclear physics that before we did not know? And, and I will uh, expound on that more deeply. But it was interesting to have that discussion. I remember it was a vigorous one. And, and David kept referring to the work that we had been engaged in as a new tool. Uh, he liked to poke at people in that way. And that's good because it gets one to thinking and to recognizing that um, there's more than one way to skin a cat, some of which has advanced mathematical methods, but the other is computational, and that's, that's important for all. In addition, uh, let me look at the time. I, I pulled up a timeline that I developed that focused in on, in red, on uh, uh, the SU3 model of Elliot, upon which the Roe Rosenstiel SP3R model, symplectic model, uh, move forward from. And it shows that in the timeline from the 60s up to um, the 90s was a, was a period of growth in the whole area of algebraic modeling in nuclear physics. Uh, that was intercepted by, I, I don't like using that, but it was, it was uh, augmented with the advent of high performance computing um, era, which started in the 90s and made it possible to test many of these theories that theretofore had not been able to be appropriately tested. Um, okay. Um, I point out here for completeness, I, I don't show the article, but uh, for completeness, David Rose pedagogical reviews of which there were many four particularly important one, and especially the last one of those four, it can be downloaded from the archive um, and is, is a classic. And David's role influence on this field among the giants in which he worked and many of these, uh, shown in the picture adjacent to David Rose's picture is, um, are the giants of the field up until uh, the era of high performance computing. So what, what high performance computing allowed us to do is move into what is called a no core shell model configuration. And I show that on the left here it's to look at the shell model, not in terms of simply the valence shells that one normally thinks of it, but as 
excitations above those, and in particular, one particle, one hole, two H bar omega excitations, which are shown by the longer of the two arrows on the left. And it also allowed one to bring forward the use of realistic interactions, not phenomenology, to actually test some of the other theories that are in play. And this began with, with the work of uh, James Ferry, Peter Navratil, and, and Bruce Barrett around uh, 2000 to the present. Um, but it's basically the single particle shell model revisited in terms of what the no core shell model uh, could bring you through high performance computing. The flip side of that, and the one that we have spent a lot of time working on, is the symplectic shell model, SP dash no core shell model, uh, on the right in green. And that's uh, Rowe and Rosenstiel's work. Um, and it shows that you can do, you can reorganize the shell model space as done with the no core shell model, which was basically a Slater determinant of single particle states into uh, a reorganized shell model, which is complete. Um, and it's in fact a, a unitary transformation, a canonical transformation, better yet, into the symplectic model space. And that gets one into not only what's happening within a single shell, and among the nucleons that reside in that shell, but also to what happens if you allow them to um, move upward, if you like, add two H bar omega excitations to the, to the picture. And that gets you into the symplectic realm. And that's shown on the far right in terms of the symplectic raising and lowering operators, as well as the, the SU3 band head configurations of Elliot that one uses. It's an interesting, uh, we call it the symmetry adapted basis. It has special features. As I pointed out, it's in the center there. It's, it's con canonical and unitary. It's organized into shapes. Um, it's quadratic in the X and P's, uh, coordinates and momenta. Uh, the band head configurations define much of the physics that's going on at the lowest level, but it also allows you to address the spurious center of mass motion appropriately, captures collectivity in a very unique, and it clearly shows why deformation dominates. It's an algebraic framework at its best, um, and I'll speak a little bit to a, uh, an effective field theory that is now known and seems to be natural that builds forward from that foundation. Okay, let me, let me just move more quickly. Uh, the generators of sympectic group are, are 21. There are the SU3s plus the raising and lowering um, and a total of 21. Um, I don't know if uh, Thomas is, Dietrich is, is on or not, uh, but he might show you this picture. I'll not dwell on it, but it, tells you that every configuration is labeled by an SU3 lambda mu quantum number of Elia, which defines the shape of the so-called bandhead configurations of the symplectic, the full symplectic model. Um, this was a campaign that we entered into. Um, it was a high risk venture for us. Um, it started in the late, my thinking anyway, in, in the late, um, 90s and moved into with the help of all of the folks uh, from my, my team and forward and beyond working and, and taking on the challenge of actually building a symmetry adapted no core shell model, SA dash NCSM. And it was a campaign that stretched over. Um, what I called uh, an initial period to the students that were there then. And it was Thomas Dietrich, as well as Christina, uh, who is, I think, on this uh, call. Uh, they took the risk with me. I gave them the option, and we worked it in five-year chunks and said, this is, could 
potentially negatively impact you getting your PhD uh, because in the five year period, you should already be up and out. But they stuck through it and, and rode through this with me and both of them I'm happy to report are a huge part of the success of this model. And it builds forward from the, the work that Karul, for example, did when he was a student at LSU working with me. By the way, uh, he came to me via, uh, uh, Thomas came to me, sorry, via a recommendation from David. Uh, Karul came and actually ended up being a postdoc with David, bringing with him the same story that I'm telling to you now. So it was uh, an interesting, unfolding of teamwork at a distance. The plan was to, to do essentially what the no floor show model did, but in a symmetry adapted basis. And it shows you the steps that we went through to do that and to prove it. And now I'm going to go quickly into the first results that we looked at were for lithium six. That's because we could test it and, and whether or not uh, our work was identical because claim that the models were identical and in fact they were and the first results were for lithium six and max 10 and to my delight and surprise um, the the value of the symplectic identification which is the long bars on the right show that typically 70 to 90 percent of the whole story of the low-lying states for lithium are within one symplectic band. It doesn't require uh, the full space, but a very selected subspace thereof, which belongs to one symplectic band head. And as you see, that's 64% then 18 and on up. And that's because of the enhanced BE2s that one finds um, in atomic nuclei. The next thing we took on was uh, carbon 12. Um, the God nucleus, as some call it, uh, because it's an interesting case where you have particle hole excitations and you can see, oh, can you cast these in terms of a symplectic picture? And indeed you can, and, and it's shown here. And we show some results. First, with simple symplectic, with no, no mixing at all beyond just symplectic. And you see that the result looks like um, a dumbbell, almost, not quite. It gets better as one moves up and adds a little bit of mixing turn on, and that's simply the L squared mixing. This was work, some work that uh, Thomas and Christina looked at. And you'll see that, in fact, as you go up in excitation energy, it settles down and you get almost perfect overlap with experimental results. Okay, um, this I will go over quickly. Um, it's not published as shown across here. It's a paper that's been accepted by the APS, American Physical Society as a PRC, um, and it's to be published. Actually, it's the thesis work of Dave, David Keechan, um, uh, who graduated just the last semester of last year. Um, the thesis is, as you know, at least in, in, the, uh, in the US, you hold your thesis for a year before you're allowed to publish them. So I'm just giving you a, an alert. It's already out on the archive, um, basic paper based on it. But what it does, it casts it in the language of a field theory. And it's an effective field theory that works and, and has demonstrated to work in this paper. Um, and the symplectic symmetry via an effective field theory perspective from a, an effective field theory perspective emerges naturally from a quantum field theory. And that's a first step, a big step in the direction of understanding the origin of deformation and how it relates to what high energy folks uh, use as their primary tool, maybe, that is a quantum field theory approach to understanding the structure of matter. 
some of the early results that we show here. You may not like what the spectrum looks like in this first one, uh, but note that it gets, it gets the transition rates correct and it gets the, the, um, uh, the RMS radius correct. Um, it gets everything that one knows about carbon-12 correct for the most part. And that's within a very simple picture. And here's another one for neon 20, um, which is even better, um, but it gets the primary things that one knows with certainty about the structure of, in the previous case, carbon 12, now neon, and many cents that, that is appreciated. So to quote from our president, here's the deal, okay? Um, low energy nuclear physics and its discoveries, we're now 100 years into it, the first 50 of which um, I, I talked in some detail about, but the physics changed technology. That's correct. That, that happened, we know, in the 50s and 60s, where, where um, vacuum tubes yielded to transistors and so on and so forth. And with it came the high performance era of uh, computational physics. And that took us into what is now calling 21st century subatomic physics, uh, bigger computers. So technology changed physics, but physics changed, was changed the technology. And, and the two together is bigger computers. You could do more with them. Whoops, sorry, I moved it. Um, better results? Well, that's for you to determine. We, we think much better results because we can go a whole lot further uh, through uh, recognizing the importance of a very, very significant uh, symplectic symmetry that uh, I give much credit to David Rowe and in particular to Rowe and Rosenstiel for their hand in making this uh, way back in the 80s before big computers were available as a primary infrastructure that um, that now is unfolding in a new and special way. And it exposes partial symmetries, but partial symmetries that are extremely good. And, and it exposes coherent features in a simple way as we've not seen before. So uh, simpler picture, I think so. Clear results, still to be determined. Um, let me just add a uh, final thought. Um, first of all, uh, discussions with David Rowell, whether we were climbing Mount Vesuvius together, which is a, a beautiful vista view of, of, of the Amalfi Coast at that point, or a lunch, a simple lunch at Jefferson Lab, which goes back seven years, where I asked of the experimentalist at Jefferson Lab, is the nucleon itself deformed or is it round? Um, they thought I was crazy, um, but within two years, they had produced um, a nature article which discussed the deformation of the nucleon. And the deformation of the nucleon carries over into the deformation of atomic nuclei. And that is the beginning of building a bridge. Still a lot of work to be done, uh, but I think with an effective field theory and us talking a common language, that is in fact lies in the future. And it's something that I wish David were here to talk through this because he would ask the tough questions. He would challenge the results, but he would as his first slide that I showed to you earlier, he appreciated the significance of this connection. Um, and we give great credit to David. So to members of, of the Rowe family that are present, um, from a nuclear physics point of view, David was a superstar. And we appreciate that and, and know it well. 
And I will end on that, thanking you for an opportunity to discuss this. Um, my slides will be available. They're, they're animated if you want. Um, I think Iber has the, uh, has the version that's, that's uh, animated. Uh, but again, thank you very much. And particularly to the, the Roe family and the fact that, you know, we all started from humble beginnings. Um, I grew up at a farm boy in Minnesota. My parents came over from the Netherlands. Uh, David didn't, he came from humble beginnings uh, and rose to stardom. And we certainly appreciate it. And, and thank you for this opportunity to share with you. I hope you were able to uh, see and get the spirit of what I was trying to relay to you. Um, David Rowe played a major role in defining the future of nuclear theory from an algebraic perspective, treating nucleons as fermions, not bosons, graduated into the 21st century view of subatomic physics. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Hi, Jerry. Yes. This guy, Ro. How, How are you? you? Haven't seen you for a long time. Very long time. Yes, indeed. I just returned to physics in the beginning of this year. Well, that's good. You, you, you know a lot of this stuff, so that's very, <laughs> very good. Well, you already picked up my thunder, but anyway, that's great. You know, a maestro for this in this area. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in uh, pursuing in the effective field theory that you hinted in the end. Yes. Uh, John yeah. Wood, you were graciously shared that information before he left for um, from UK. Yes. Um, <clears throat> he was aware. <laughs> yes. Um, one thing that I, I'm, 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 I'm kind of uh, intrigued that uh, the field theory in nuclear physics is pretty much more in the um, <clears throat> in the realm of, of phenomenological, um, probably along the line, you know, the concept of phonons in the condensed matter physics or magnons or so many quasi particles. It's not, uh, sorry, Kirill, it's not phenomenological. All hmm. the interactions, I didn't stress this, but all the interactions that we used um, are based on effective interactions that okay. are produced to us from scattering data by those that cook uh, up realistic interactions. So in, in the real applications that we make, there is not a phenomenological interaction. It's, it, it's, a, it's a microscopic interaction that is we adopt. There are no free parameters in it and it reproduces the physics. I think I have to rephrase the word phenomenological correctly here because the the concept of phenomenology can, can be at, at, at any level, either at the electronic level or at the at the subparticle or particle um, level. Yeah, I got but, it. Uh, in I particular, it. Uh, I'm interested in the physics of phi that is introduced there. That's number one. Um, <clears throat> number two. Um, you know, I don't know whether uh, in this, in the model that you have, um, or David, uh, your students have that, uh, the boundary condition of this field, whether this is a spherical or, 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 or any, um, any shape, or rather the uh, Cartesian or kind of a box potential to be able to, to come up with. It's a it's a it's a good question. The <coughs> effective field theory uh, approach uh, is a plane wave approach, mm. and we show that the plane wave solution, when augmented by the fact that nucleons like to cluster, um, and and in particular that the symplectic group. Uh, as we haven't spoken about it until now, is really the dynamical symmetry group of the harmonic oscillator. Right. And, and it works 
um, across the spectrum of atomic nuclei. I think you, you will find that it not only has application for light species, but for heavier species. Mm -hmm. We have some results that show great promise. So it is a plane wave theory out of which deformation emerges naturally um, in terms of the dominance of the quadrupole interaction among the nucleons themselves. So welcome back aboard. <laughs> uh, if in fact that's your desire, um, and we're certainly uh, interested in pushing this connection. It's not going to happen anytime soon, mm. uh, but we are working with the people on the other side, meaning the high energy side, who are certainly experts in the field and knocking on the door. Uh, the structure now of, of uh, pions in particular, because that's a two quark system. Right. And ultimately, we want to understand the structure of the nucleon as they see it in terms of three quarks or multiple quarks or whatever it is, and how that drives the deformation of the, of the um, deuteron, for example, starting mm -hmm. right at the lowest level and then rising up through the carbon 12s, the oxygens, and up into the heavier nuclear species, uh, all of which seem to respect the, the uh, dominance of symplectic symmetry in a way that far exceeds even my fondest dreams and mm. those of our team. Uh, and it's amazing, it's, it's really good. And I think that, go that holds high promise with still a lot of work 